a woman becomes a mother. The latest US research shows this is a time of amazing changes in the brain. Scientists have found that after childbirth, tissues in a woman's brain thicken in more than 30 places, and this enhances her skills as a mother. <laughs> this experiment illustrates the effects. We asked 10 mums to identify their own babies by the sound of their cries. They may all sound similar, but... This mother identified the first as her baby. And she was right. Amazingly, all 10 mums correctly picked out their babies just by hearing them cry. A closer look reveals why. When a mother hears the sound of her own baby crying, activity levels in different parts of the brain shoot up. Compare this to what happens when a mother hears someone else's baby cry. Mothers undergo far-reaching changes that even affect their brains. But today, many struggle with the tasks of child rearing and don't know how to cope. <coughs> Feelings of anxiety and isolation mysteriously bubble up. I thought, what kind of torture is this? <coughs> Some feel desperate, wondering why mothering is so hard. I sometimes blame myself. And instead of seeing their husbands as their partners, some women feel overcome with irritation. We use the latest scientific findings to unravel these mysteries. Our search took us to a part of Africa where the earliest parenting practices still live on. The reasons today's mums feel down can be traced back over seven million years of human evolution. The key lies in a variety of intriguing mechanisms in the body and the brain. The message to mums everywhere is this, parenting is challenging. An event space in Tokyo is packed with mothers and their infants, about 10,000 in all. In one corner, mothers share their troubles and concerns about raising children. More and more women lack confidence as mothers and seek peers they can talk with. Maiko is one such mum. She lives in a condominium in the center of the city. Work keeps her husband away until late. Their daughter often cries, and all day, Maiko looks after the baby on her own. <coughs> Meal time. The baby seems to be enjoying it, but... I feel so unsure. Is she getting enough nutrients to grow? Good. 
Being alone with the baby fuels Maiko's uncertainty, though she doesn't know why. Maiko became overwhelmed by anxiety and loneliness. She went to a doctor and began taking medication. I thought, what kind of torture is this? No one warned me. I didn't expect parenting would make me so depressed. And I'd lose confidence. Every day was a letdown, far short of my expectations. <laughs> Maiko's experiences are not uncommon. The rate of depression among women after childbirth is over five times higher than the average. Today's new mothers are more prone to feelings of insecurity and isolation. New research helps to explain why. The answer lies in a hormone that's secreted in the ovaries and plays a central role in pregnancy, oestrogen. Oestrogen levels rise during pregnancy and drop sharply after childbirth. The change affects the way neurons work and makes the brain susceptible to feelings of insecurity and loneliness. There's actually a scientific reason mothers are wired this way. A researcher in Japan has taken an unusual approach to explain why. Tetsuro Matsuzawa is a world leader in chimpanzee research. A closest primate relative raises its young much the way we do. Mother chimps stay with their children full time for five years until they're ready to go off on their own. Yet mother chimpanzees don't seem to face the same struggles their human counterparts do. If we look back in time, we see that chimpanzees and humans split from a common ancestor about seven million years ago. Matsuzawa believes something happened around that time that affected the way humans raise children. To find out more, he and his colleagues headed for the central African country of Cameroon. A group of people there has drawn the attention of anthropologists. They plough through the jungle for two hours. A small village comes into view. This is the home of the Baka forest nomads. They hunt animals and gather nuts in the jungle, continuing a lifestyle passed down from ancient times. This is Matsuzawa's first visit to the village. <laughs> he begins mimicking a chimpanzee's call. <laughs> that breaks the ice. <laughs> and right away, he notices something interesting. The typical Baka family is large. For instance, this mother has 11 children. Seven years old, six, three and two, they're very close in age. The ability to have many children at short intervals that's what sets humans apart from chimpanzees. In fact, mother chimps can't become pregnant during the five years they spend child rearing. 
In contrast, humans have evolved to be able to have a child as often as every year. This allowed humans to multiply quickly and thrive. But a system was needed so women could continue having babies while raising children. Ancient people found a solution in a style of child rearing that's still practiced by the Bakar people. <laughs> These mothers set out to find firewood, leaving their three-month-old babies with other women. The babies become hungry. But this woman is pregnant and can't produce milk. Another woman steps in, picks up the baby and begins breastfeeding it. No animals besides humans entrust others to care for their young offspring. But the development of group parenting allowed humans to keep having and raising children. Evolutionary history might also explain why oestrogen levels plummet upon childbirth, leaving mothers feeling vulnerable. Some researchers believe it was meant to encourage women to collaborate in childbearing. Feeling anxious and alone after childbirth would make new mothers more inclined to stick together. Evolution has programmed humans to cooperate in child rearing and be ready to take care of one another's children. But these days mothers must raise children without help from others. That's beyond human capacity. We're not made to be able to handle it. Ancient style group parenting isn't realistic in modern societies, yet the instinct to share parenting duties endures. Matsuzawa believes this gap between the desire to share child rearing duties and today's environment is what causes mothers to feel lonely. He says there's another reason why mums are susceptible to the blues. He also learned this from chimpanzees. An artificially bred chimpanzee gives birth. The mother runs away from the baby she's just delivered. She squeals frantically, apparently unable to recognise the newborn as her own. In fact, half of artificially bred chimpanzees end up rejecting their babies, not even cradling them after delivery. Matsuzawa suspected it's because chimps bred in captivity have less exposure to motherhood than their wild counterparts. To test this theory, he encouraged a chimp in the late stages of pregnancy to play mother using a stuffed baby. He also showed her a video of a wild chimpanzee taking care of her young. Two weeks later, the chimp went into labour. She gently holds the head of the baby as it emerges to keep it from falling.
The new mother immediately embraces her baby. It appears that learning about child rearing in advance helped the chimp make a successful start as a mother. Matsuzawa says group parenting passed down from ancient times also plays an important role in preparing women for motherhood. <laughs> Among the Baka people, fishing is women's work. A little girl looks after a baby while the mothers are fishing. Children here customarily take part in group parenting from early on. Matsuzawa believes this plays a significant role in preparing them for future motherhood. A recent experiment backed up this idea. <laughs> Ten university students who have never been mothers took part. They were assigned to babysit for two hours a week for three months. Afterward, they were shown images of a crying baby. Significant changes were evident in their brains. This shows activity in a subject's brain before the experiment. After three months of babysitting, activity spikes in regions associated with parenting. This suggests the subject is more likely to feel love and affection toward children. Matsuzawa sums it up by saying the women's brains show signs of activity associated with motherhood. Motherhood is a very deep, complex function. It's not a simple matter at all. It's not easy to be a mother. Most people today don't practice group parenting. Women enter motherhood without having opportunities to learn about it in advance. Experts believe this is adding to modern mothers' feelings of insecurity. Mothers struggle with another source of stress. It's their kids' difficult behaviour. More than a few mothers blame their own bad parenting for this. One of the first challenges for mothers begins right after childbirth. Nighttime crying. Every time the baby cries, this mother breastfeeds it. But the baby still doesn't sleep. When a mother gets hardly any sleep, parenting becomes exhausting. Many babies cry at night, disturbing their parents. The latest science offers a surprising explanation. Researchers found a clue by observing babies still in the womb. This is a fetus at nine months gestation. It's sucking on a finger. This one is yawning. Researchers have analysed high-resolution images to map fetal sleeping patterns in detail. Babies in the womb go through deep and light sleep cycles day and night. 
The red lines show where a foetus is woken up during light sleep. Interestingly, it wakes up more often at night than during the day. When a foetus is awake, it moves actively using more oxygen from the mother's blood. To minimise the burden, they're programmed to wake up more often at night when the mother is resting. This sleeping pattern lingers for a while after birth. And that's why babies cry at night. A fetal mechanism to protect the mother during pregnancy becomes problematic after birth. Further research has revealed another intriguing fact about the way babies sleep. Researchers attached electrodes to a baby's head to measure its brain waves. They look at the waves to see if the baby is asleep or awake. The baby is sound asleep. The brain waves fluctuate gently, suggesting a deep state of sleep. Ten minutes later, the baby has opened its eyes. But the brain waves remain stable, so even though its eyes aren't open, the baby hasn't woken up. More time passes. The baby makes a noise, but the brain waves show it's still sleeping. Infants often appear to be awake even though they're not. The brain remains active even during sleep. An area of the brain stem called the reticular formation works to block signals from reaching the body, allowing a person to rest. But this mechanism is not completely functional in babies' immature brains, so signals slip through from time to time, causing physical and vocal activity during sleep. A baby may make a little move or open its eyes. If the mother then wakes the baby up right away, that could wind up depriving the baby of sleep. Babies move while they're asleep. I want people to understand that this is normal. Nighttime crying isn't the only headache mothers face. This 11 month old girl does something that gives her mum a hard time. Today, a good friend comes to visit. The mother asks her friend to watch her daughter for a short time. <laughs> the girl breaks into tears. She treats the friend as a complete stranger. But once back in her mum's arms, all is well. Stranger anxiety keeps the girl clinging tight. Her mother can't ask anyone to look after her daughter. At night, there's hope for relief. The little girl's father returns from work. But she even shies away from her own dad. The father soon gives up and looks to the mum for help. <laughs> Str 
stranger anxiety adds to a mother's stress. The latest research has shed light on this stage of development. <laughs> this 10-month-old began crying the moment she saw the cameraman. We showed the baby the faces of her mum and a woman she doesn't know. The point of the experiment is to see which face the baby looks at more. The red dot shows where the baby's looking. As expected, she fixes her gaze on mum, but she soon turns her eyes toward the stranger. Again and again, the baby looks at the woman she doesn't know. When we conducted the same experiment with a baby who hasn't yet developed stranger anxiety, she glues her eyes to mum and doesn't look at the stranger. Until around six months, babies can recognise only people close to them, such as their mothers. Once they get a bit older, they begin recognising other people and take an interest in them. And that's when stranger anxiety kicks in. Babies begin wanting to connect with others through their mothers. It's the first step in becoming social, which enables them to relate to people other than their moms. It's a crucial period of development. Yet babies cry even if they're interested in a person. Meeting another person's eyes automatically activates a part of the brain called the amygdala, which plays a key role in detecting fear. In adults, the recognition that someone poses no danger activates the prefrontal area, curbing the feeling of fear. But in babies, immature brains, the prefrontal area isn't fully functional. So when their eyes meet someone else's, they instinctively feel strong fear and begin crying. Curiosity makes them look at other people's eyes, but their brains immediately feel fear, causing them to cry. That's the mechanism behind stranger anxiety. Neither nighttime crying nor stranger anxiety are observed in other animals young. That's because their brains are almost fully mature at birth. A human newborn's brain is about one-third the weight of an adult's. That raises a question. Exactly why are humans born with immature brains? To find the answer, we must go seven million years back in time when humans began walking upright. The change in posture also altered the shape of the human pelvis, narrowing the birth canal. To pass through, babies must be born before their brains grow large and mature. Human brains take more than 10 years to develop. The immaturity of children's brains explains their perplexing behaviours. As we've seen, these behaviours can be vexing for parents, and they change as kids develop. For example... The no-no phase sets in at around the age of two. This is when some children throw tantrums and cry uncontrollably, unable to suppress their impulses. 
は片付けてないし全然何も片付けしてないのに動画は見れないよ For three-year-old show, the no-no phase began nearly a year ago. He's playing with his younger brother. Oh, his brother's taken a piece. Then... Show gets rough. I often wonder if something's wrong with him. I blame myself too. Young children's insistent nose can be understood by looking at their brains. Researchers have studied what happens inside the brain when children exercise self control. In children who have come out of the no phase, activity picks up in a certain area of the brain. But among children in the no phase, the area remains inactive, even when they try hard to restrain themselves. The area called the prefrontal area is responsible for curbing impulses. Instinctive urges form at the centre of the brain, but the prefrontal area can't suppress them if it's not fully developed. That's why young children say no to almost everything. As their brains develop and the prefrontal area becomes functional, their defiance gradually subsides. For parents, the nose can seem to last forever. Hi, hi guys, thank you so much for coming to the lab today. Clancy Blair is a world-renowned expert on impulse inhibition. He says many years of research have revealed the keys to developing control. The reasons for, I think that's really the best. When the caregiver just says stop, because I say so, right? When the parent does that, or when the, the preschool teacher does that, it can regulate, the child can regulate their behavior then, but they're being regulated by the mother. Blair says the amygdala, which influences fear and anxiety, becomes active when children are told to stop. Their impulses are temporarily held in check by fear. But the inhibitory capabilities of the prefrontal area are not yet functional. It's important to control their behavior and to use inhibitory control, and that will really help foster the development of inhibitory control in children. Blair says there are ways to encourage the process. He recommends setting rules that are easy to understand. For example, a game like this one can help nurture control. Ava, be our reader. And you can go back to your seat and you're gonna be partners with Kaylee and you're gonna be the listener, okay? All right. And then I'm gonna do your She divides children into pairs. Each child gets a card, one with a mouth, the other with an ear. Children with a mouth card read a picture book out loud. Children with the ear card are supposed to listen without speaking. This girl has gotten the ear card. The pizza man, the policeman, and the tow truck, the digger, and the fireman, and... You have the ear. You have the ear card, so you are the listener, okay? The girl holds back, remembering the rule. The important thing is to help children understand why they have to control themselves. 
practicing this again and again nurtures the prefrontal area's ability to inhibit impulses. Sho has had difficulty controlling himself because of his immature brain. But recently, his behavior has started to change. Uh-oh, his brother has broken up the train track. Sho looks upset. He seems to be on the brink of shoving his little brother. But he holds back. His eyes fill with tears, yet he doesn't act. Then, he hands his brother a toy. Sho's mother hugs him, a reward for restraining himself. <laughs> Children's brains develop slowly but steadily, supported by the grown-ups around them. Child-rearing is a long, challenging process. Fathers are supposed to play a significant role along with mothers. But a serious problem has emerged among child-rearing couples. This chart shows the number of divorces in families with small children. Surprisingly, most occur when children are aged two or younger. For many couples, that's the most challenging phase of parenting. A big factor appears to be mothers' intense feelings of frustration toward their partners. Masumi has a three-month-old boy named Yo. She says she can't help but feel irritated by her husband. Even when he tries to play with the baby on a rare day off, she finds herself showering him with harsh words. <laughs> She says she's constantly annoyed by her husband's clumsiness with the baby. They got along very well when it was just the two of them. But since Yo's arrival, they've spoken to each other less and less. Osamu, the husband, is perplexed by the change in his wife. She scolds me when I try to help her. It makes me think I would be better to stay away. Researchers have found that the frustration mothers feel is due to a certain hormone. An area of the brain called the pituitary gland secretes oxytocin. Levels of the hormone spike during labor, breastfeeding, and when mums interact with their children. Oxytocin works directly on the brain, boosting feelings of affection toward both partners and offspring. For these reasons, it's called the love hormone. It may seem strange that it also makes mothers feel annoyed towards their husbands. Recent studies have found that oxytocin has another unexpected function. A mother rat raising her young. Her brain releases a large quantity of oxytocin, encouraging affectionate feelings toward her offspring. When another rat approaches, the mother attacks. 
But when oxytocin levels are suppressed, the mother rat approaches the intruder but doesn't attack. This indicates that oxytocin not only boosts affection, but also triggers aggressiveness. Um, although uh, many people think of oxytocin as a love hormone or a bonding hormone, one of the kind of the underbellies of that is that when that love or bond is threatened, then the oxytocin actually functions to make the woman more aggressive. A disaster for a marriage if his social cues and he's not being supportive, not being helpful, and she perceives that as such. It might seem like the answer to keeping harmony is for men to play a bigger role in child rearing. But it's not as simple as it may seem. Tatia has a three-year-old daughter and a six-month-old son. He devotes his days off to helping his wife, who's busy with a baby. He plays with their daughter and looks after her. I help with the kids. I think men ought to help, because even if we do pitch in, it's still a tough job. It might sound like a recipe for perfect harmony, but in fact... My friends envy me, but he's often oblivious to the children's needs. It bothers me. She's irritated. Just being supportive isn't enough. A close look at Tatsuya's behaviour shows why. Hitomi glances at her children before she begins eating. Tatsuya, on the other hand, concentrates on his food. The baby begins to cry. Tatsuya doesn't seem to notice. But Hitomi springs up from her seat. While she bustles around attending to the children, Tatsuya finishes his meal. Later, we showed them the video. <laughs> you failed to notice a lot of things. Right. I'm so unresponsive to the kids. <laughs> The husband is not as attentive to his children as his wife is. A recent study helps to explain why. Researchers in Italy carried out an intriguing experiment. Nine men and nine women took part. Some were parents and some were not. All were asked to wear headphones and let their minds drift. Periodically, noises, including a baby's cry, came through the headphones. The researchers wanted to measure how responsive male and female brains are to each sound. The results show that the women's brains were more attentive to the baby's cries than to other noises. But the men's brains responded to all the sounds in almost the same way. In short, the experiment confirmed that male brains are not as sensitive as female brains are to infants' cries. An expert says this is one reason why women sometimes feel irritated by their husbands. It's only natural that fathers and mothers react differently to a child's cries 
Mothers are quick to respond to a crying baby, so they expect their partners to notice the sound promptly and react in the same way. But fathers can't meet their expectations. It seems that's why mothers become annoyed. Understanding the differences between male and female brains and supporting one another are both important for healthy relationships in child-rearing couples. And there are ways for men to become better caregivers. Recent studies have found that the more fathers participate in childcare, the more significantly their brains change. In an experiment in Israel, 41 fathers were asked to spend 15 minutes with their children. Researchers then took blood samples and analysed them. The men's bodies produced more oxytocin, the love hormone, after they spent time with their children. Another experiment looked at oxytocin levels after fathers played affectionately with their babies. When the father's oxytocin levels rose, the babies did too. Researchers believe this synchronization deepens the bonds of affection between father and child. Men and women have different strengths when it comes to parenting skills. But for both, being involved in child rearing deepens connections with their children and their partners. By supporting each other, couples can make it through the long and challenging process of parenting. This arrangement developed over humans' long journey of evolution. The origins of our approach to parenting can still be found deep in the African jungle. Our bodies and brains have evolved so that we can cooperate and support each other in raising children. But for many women today, motherhood is a solitary endeavour. It's as if we've gone backward on the evolutionary path. Now, we're gaining the knowledge needed to turn things around. Science is revealing the way forward. <laughs>